So the woman who climbed a mountain while she felt she was having a heart attack now can't even wash her dishes. I that couldn't even so wash dishes. for you. It was awful. What is myocardial bridging? Why might someone with myocardial bridging have a heart attack? What is the heart chamber? Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and your host. I'm also a heart mom, an adult, born with a single ventricle heart, and who is 28 years old. This is the reason I am the host of this podcast. Today's episode is called Myocardial Bridging and Boots Knighton, and our guest is Boots Knighton. Boots Knighton is a 45-year-old myocardial bridging survivor from Victor, Idaho, and an avid mountain biker. She suffered a heart attack while biking when she was in her 40s. To correct the myocardial bridging, she underwent open-heart surgery in 2021. Her experiences have inspired her to start a podcast called The Heart Chamber, and she's also working on a book. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna Boots Knighton. Hey, thanks for having me today. This is so fun. Thanks. It's an honor. This is, uh, this is so much fun, and it's an honor for me to talk to you. I've listened to some of your new podcast. And it's always exciting for me to talk to another podcaster. So let's just get started because I have published 420 episodes of Heart to Heart with Anna, and I have never met anyone with myocardial bridging. I had to go look it up because I had never heard of it before. And I bet most of my listeners have never heard of it. Can you tell me a little bit more about this heart condition? Yes, it's congenital. It's anatomical. So it's where as my heart was forming and growing and the arteries were forming around it, instead of the artery staying on top and out of the heart muscle, three of my arteries tunneled into the heart muscle, became like stuck in the heart muscle. And so when I was born, my LAD, the Widowmaker artery, as well as the branches of my LCX artery, were stuck in that heart muscle. So that means that every time my heart beat, those arteries were squeezed and the blood flow was cut off. So a metaphor or analogy that I use to describe it is if you take a garden hose and you pinch it to stop the flow of water, that is basically a myocardial bridge. And if you pinch it too many times, the garden hose stops the flow of water, even if you open it back up, right? The flow just doesn't return readily. And so eventually that garden hose just gives out. It loses its pliability. And that's what happened with me. By my 40s, my arteries had lost their pliability. And then that led to the one day when I was mountain biking and I had heart attack symptoms. So what were those symptoms? It's interesting because the day before, my husband and I had gone on a walk and we were experiencing an incredible amount of stress in our life at the time. Both moms had been diagnosed with cancer. My car engine had blown up all in the same week. And both of them got their diagnoses almost on the exact same day. It was just too much. And it was also COVID, right? So the time oh, of COVID oh <laughs> in sure. the background. Of course. So we were like, we need to go on a walk. And as we're walking on this beautiful trail here in Teton Valley, Idaho, where I live, I was like, man, my left arm is hurting. And I feel like I have an elephant on my chest. And I'm like thinking this quietly to myself. And I'm a wilderness first responder. And so I have tons of medical training and I've gone through the course twice. So it's not like I've just heard it once. And I'm like, I am having all the heart attack symptoms. I was nauseous. I felt the stabbing in my back. I was sweating. I was having breathlessness. Oh, and I didn't say anything to my husband. I was like, this is just stress. There's no way. I was in such oh, good shape. And so... Oh. I go to bed that night and all the symptoms go away. I'm like, yeah, it was just stress. So the next day we go on a mountain bike ride and I am all the same symptoms come back. It was only upon exertion. And 
I'm like pushing my bike up this hill, which it wasn't normal. And my husband, he was like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, I feel terrible. I feel absolutely terrible. I really feel like I'm having a heart attack. And I go through all the symptoms. He's like, we need to call 911. And we were like way deep in this mountain range near Teton Valley. And we could see the Tetons from afar. And we had just finally gotten to the top of this really big climb. And I was like, there is no way I'm calling 911. I'm finishing this mountain bike ride. This oh is my cats. gosh, foods. Now, as a medical responder, what would you have said to a person <laughs> like you? I'm like, oh, my gosh. Here I am. At the time, I was 42. And I was literally in the best shape I had ever been in. But you were having a heart attack. <laughs> but I didn't think I was because who would be oh having a heart attack at 42? Who was fit? Like I eat all organic. I don't drink. Who would ever think I'd have a heart attack? had that diagnosed as a child. So it's not like you knew from a young age. I knew nothing that about heart my heart. was funky. I knew nothing. And so... We get back to the house. I'm still having all these symptoms. And Jason's like, I'm taking you to the hospital. And I was like, I'm hungry. I took your shower. Oh my gosh. I took make a- dinner. I didn't want to go to the hospital smelly. Oh, I go through all these excuses. And he finally calls a friend who's a doctor. And the doctor's like, get her to the hospital. So yes. hours later, <laughs> we get to the hospital. And I still have like crushing pain in my left arm, crushing pain in the chest. And they do all the tests and they treated it very seriously, which was amazing. And they don't find anything. No elevated troponin, no EKG soundings. They did an x-ray of my heart and they're like, you're fine, but you're obviously not fine. You need to go to a cardiologist. We don't need to fly you out tonight because I go to the Jackson, Wyoming hospital and they just can't even treat heart attacks. And so they normally life flight people to Salt Lake City. Utah. And the doctor was like, I'm really glad I don't have to life flight you tonight, but you need to get into a cardiologist because this isn't right. And so I left feeling silly because I was like, see, it was just stress and I'm fine. But I still made the cardiology appointment just because I'm a curious mind. And I was Please like, Please tell oh, me for just... the next day. Please tell me it was for the next he, day. It was no rush. It was no rush. And according uh... to the ER doc. And so I got in a few days later and he was like, Miss Knighton, why is someone like you in my office? And I was like, I'd like to know the same thing. This is what happened. And he said, we should probably do some investigating. My guess is that it is stress. And I said, but here's the thing. I've had stress and this doesn't feel like stress. At the time, I was on an antidepressant and an anti-anxiety med. Because he was saying it was probably anxiety. And I was like, had anxiety. And this isn't that. And Mm -hmm. it all feels really different. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure you're right. Like, I'm sure we're going to end up saying it's just mental health. Because who would want to think otherwise? I just (sighs) kept blaming that. And I'd give anything for it to have been that. Anyway, he said, I'm going to go looking for all these things. And I said, hey, I've actually planned this climb in a week. I was going to go climb. Mount Bora, which is the highest peak in Idaho with friends and my husband. I was like, can I still go? And he's like, I don't see why not. So I went. Oh my gosh. Did he at least give you a halter monitor no, so nothing, he could see nothing. what was going on? He hadn't done any testing yet. And he's like, let's just see how things go. We went and my husband didn't want us to do it, but I was just thinking this is likely just stress. The moment we started walking, all the symptoms came back and my deepest intuition was saying something's wrong with your heart. And Mm -hmm. my ego was saying, get to the top of this peak. And so amazingly, I climbed this peak in four hours, which was like lightning fast. And I got to the top and I was like, see, I'm fine. But the whole time I felt like absolute crap. And I couldn't feel my fingers or my toes. I had chest pain. My left arm was hurting. I was nauseous. All the symptoms of a heart attack. And I pushed through it, which is classic athlete mentality. And the moment we started walking down the hill, when I took the pressure off my heart, 
all the symptoms went away. And that's when I knew I was in deep trouble. I was like, this is not stress. This is not stress. And then the next day I was really not okay. And then that's when they got me in the very next day for an echocardiogram and they didn't find the bridge right away. That took two more weeks, but they first Mm -hmm. found the bicuspid valve, which I still have and is okay. But then I was getting worse and worse. And then he found the myocardial bridging of not just one, but three arteries in my heart on July 30th of 2020. And he blew me off, even though he said he was going to look for it. And if he found it, he was going to want me to do something about it. When he found it, he still blew me off and said, it is anxiety. These myocardial bridges aren't that big of a deal and sent me on my way. And so then I self-referred to Stanford. And then they were really who got the ball rolling for me. Night Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. So Boots, before the break, we were learning about how you discovered you had the myocardial bridging and, girlfriend, you are crazy. I cannot believe you went up that mountain and your husband was against it and you did it anyway. But I am impressed that you made it up in four hours, came back down, and you were smart enough as you were coming back down to realize this is something really scary. And when the doctor blew you off, you were smart enough to say, I need a second opinion. So talk to us about that second opinion and what happened next. Thanks, Anna. So first of all, I found out about Stanford through the Facebook group for myocardial bridging. Oh, there's a so, Facebook group for myocardial bridging? Yes. I thought it was super rare. So that's It is impressive. rare. However, it is rare, and yet it's not. And there's a school of thought now that it isn't getting properly diagnosed and that a lot of cardiologists have learned in medical school that myocardial bridging is only benign and can't cause problems. Mm-hmm. However, Stanford... Healthcare, Stanford Hospital has proven time and time again that myocardial bridging is not benign and people do die of heart attacks from myocardial bridging. Because think about it, if it's deep enough, if the LAD or any of the other arteries are deep enough in the heart muscle and squeezed for long enough and the arteries develop something called endothelial dysfunction, which is what I have which is where the interior of the arteries basically are so damaged that they can't open and close properly. That's what cuts off that blood flow and that's what causes heart attacks and kills people. And so I, my deepest intuition knew this doctor was wrong. The irony is he worked at Stanford before he became a cardiologist here in the area. So he knew better. He knew better and shame on him. That's and I okay. asked him for a referral to Stanford, and he said it wasn't appropriate. And I said, I disagree. And so I got on Facebook one day, just out of desperation, and typed in myocardial bridging and found this support group. And at the time, there was only like 200 members. 
And now there's like over 2,000, I think. Wow. Anyway, oh. there's a lot of healthcare providers on there now. There's an awareness movement happening with this congenital defect, thankfully. So I started reading people's stories, talking to people on Messenger. And I was like, I have to get in touch with Stanford. So I referred myself. And by the end of September of 2020, they accepted me into their myocardial bridging program. They had looked at my heart CT and they're like, you definitely need help here, but you have to go through all our testing first. Oh, and there's this pandemic happening called COVID and that's what it's behind. So I actually had to wait until mid-December to fly to Stanford. Wow. They had to schedule a heart catheterization because they test the arteries to make sure that the open heart surgery to fix it would actually work. And there's all these other things that they have to do. And then they only do one open heart surgery per week for this congenital defect. And so that wasn't available till December. Why is that? Why do they only do one per week? I don't know what the reasoning is. So I had to sit. And by that point, I couldn't even stand in my kitchen to wash dishes. People were starting to bring meals because I couldn't cook. Jason was working full time. It was so stressful. And then I couldn't have visitors because I didn't want to risk getting COVID and then not being able to have the surgery. So the woman who climbed a mountain while she felt she was having a heart attack now can't even wash her dishes. That I couldn't even wash dishes. For you. It was awful. So I climbed Bora, I think it was the second week of July of 2020. And by mid-August, I couldn't even walk my driveway. And then by September, I couldn't stand. And I would have to sit to take a shower. So basically, that means that endothelial dysfunction had become so severe that even when my arteries did open after the heart had squeezed, enough blood wasn't getting through. The problem is your heart squeezes all the time, sweetie. It's Mm -hmm. not just upon physical exertion. So yes, when you're physically exerting yourself, it squeezes harder. But just to survive, it's squeezing all the time. It's a miracle you're here to talk to me. Yeah, it is really like when I look back on it, there's a lot of emotions that come up like rage. Sure, sure. <laughs> at, at oh doctor. my goodness, I'm uh, upset. And I don't <laughs> even know you that well. <laughs> I'm going to go punch somebody for not really understanding. And that's the problem is most doctors are compassionate people. And I'm sure he would not have wanted to see you suffer or to be in pain. You seem so vibrant, Boots. Mm -hmm. And you saw him after you had climbed a mountain, which would have been difficult for somebody whose heart was working perfectly well. So I can understand why he might think, oh, this woman, she's a superwoman. She's fine. It's not a big deal, especially if most of the literature at that time led doctors to believe that it was innocuous, but we know better now. So talk to us about the surgery you eventually were able to have. And I don't want to let him off the hook because he had worked at Stanford and he had worked with this myocardial bridge team. So he knew better. So I just want to state that for the record. So I flew to California in December 2020 when there was not a vaccine yet, when Mm -hmm. COVID was raging. And the day before I was supposed to fly... They called me at 10 in the morning to confirm all my appointments, they meaning Stanford, and we're so excited to see you. We know you need help. It's finally here. Mm -hmm. And an hour later, they called, your surgery's canceled. We've run out of ICU beds. Oh, no. And you didn't really want to be in the ICU with all those COVID beds. I didn't have a choice. It was like I needed the life-saving heart surgery. I was willing to do I, anything. Oh. I'd been so sitting happened, all fall. Please. I cried. I actually finally cried, sure. which I don't do a lot of. And I had to go anyway because the next time the heart cath lab was available to really look at my heart and make sure this surgery would work was in April. What? And oh, I knew I couldn't make live that long. So we decided to go. My husband's pushing me through the airport in a wheelchair. We go through all the testing at Stanford. 
I had 8 million COVID tests. My nose was so sore from all the COVID tests. And they were like, wow, you really need surgery. And sorry, but you have to get back on a plane and go home. We don't know when we're going to call you. And Palo Alto, where Stanford is, was like a ghost town. It was shut down. We couldn't find anywhere to eat, get groceries. It was an intense two weeks that we had to be there. And then we have to fly home. I remember as we're driving in our rental car back to the San Francisco airport, I remember the Facebook group and I happened to get on it and I see a woman posted that she had just had that surgery in all places, Salt Lake City, Utah, five hours south of me. And I had looked all over the Intermountain West for a surgeon who would do the surgery. It's called unroofing. And I couldn't find anyone. And she found someone hiding in plain sight. And I quickly call his office, talk to the most amazing woman. And I told her my whole story. And I was like, I am not going to live long enough to get back to Stanford. Help me. Can he help me? And so she called Stanford. She had all of my records transferred by the time I landed back home. And within three weeks, I had the unroofing surgery. So Facebook found my surgeon via Facebook. Facebook saved your life. It did. Oh my gosh. Wow. So I had my unroofing surgery January 15th, 2021. So by unroofing surgery, you had three vessels that were basically embedded in your heart's structure. Were they able to release them? Yes. I had the typical sternotomy. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Stephen McKellar, my surgeon, had to cut into my heart muscle to bring out the LAD and the LCX on the back of the heart. So I had to be put on a heart lung machine, and that sure. was for an hour and a half. Wow. And it was a success. I was very sick afterwards from the anesthesia. I threw up 25 times oh, after goodness. open heart surgery. Anesthesia oh, yeah. and I are not meant to be friends. <laughs> However, oh, once I got past that, I actually was released from the hospital early. And I remember 24 hours after my surgery, I walked from the ICU to the PCU and I immediately knew I was going to live. I could not believe the difference I felt right out of open heart surgery because the blood flow had been restored. So when he released those vessels that had been trapped by your heart, and you said there was endothelial damage that was done, did he have to cut out the areas that had been damaged and re-sew them together, or were they able to repair themselves? That's a great Or did he use the stent or something like that? No stents. So endothelial dysfunction, in fact, I was just talking to my cardiologist about this a couple of weeks ago, and her exact words were... Endothelial dysfunction is the bane of a cardiologist's existence. It is extremely hard to treat. I still have it. So all the unroofing surgery did was free my arteries. Okay. So now, yes, the blood flow is better, but those vessels don't just heal overnight. And revascularization just wasn't even part of the conversation. And I'm over two years out, and I'm better than I was in those few months leading up to the surgery, but I'm not back to who I was. I couldn't climb Mount Bora tomorrow, and I couldn't go on a typical mountain bike ride like I used to. However, I can still do short hikes, and I can do short mountain bike rides or ride an e-mountain bike. That's really helpful. What's an e-mountain bike? It's a uh, battery assist. Oh, electronic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Electronic. Yep. Well, that um, makes sense. You're mm-hmm. still exerting yourself, but you have a yeah. little bit of assistance. But those blood vessels are still not opening and closing the way that would be appropriate for my age. A stent would not have helped because I would have thought that a stent would keep them in an open position and allow new endothelial cells to grow over the stent so that it would be more normally shaped. Mm -hmm. 
That's a great question, Anna. I'm just a heart mom. Yeah. I'm not a doctor, but that's just the way that my mind works. Yeah, I appreciate that. And no one has ever mentioned that before. Call him up and ask him. I see my cardiologist again next week, and I might mention that to her just to see what she says. There's medications for endothelial dysfunction, and I'm on a nitroglycerin because my heart hurts. Well, sure. What you've done to your heart, boo. I know. It has hurt feelings. You stress the heck out of your heart. It's a miracle. It truly is a miracle you are here with us, Boots. Truly a miracle. I'm amazed, folks, we're using Zencaster today, so I actually can look at Boots, and her coloring is beautiful. I never would have guessed that she suffered something as traumatic as she has, but oh my goodness. Let's go over some of your symptoms just because... Unfortunately, I think women are often discounted when they have heart issues. And we're often told, oh, honey, it's just anxiety. It's just anxiety. I cannot tell you how many women I have had on my program who have told me that they went to the ER, they presented with certain symptoms, and they were told, oh, it's just anxiety. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, A handbook for parents will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Boots, we have learned about your extremely traumatic entree into the world of congenital heart conditions and having had surgery that improved your lifestyle, gave you your life back, but didn't give you your life back the way you knew it when you were much younger. Talk to me about why you started a podcast. That was a great reframe. (laughs) (laughs) Spoken <laughs> truly by another podcaster. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's just a, you just summed up like really hard work I've done with my therapist in the past two years of just radical acceptance of I was going in one direction and now I have basically done, let's see, what could we call it? 120. It took <laughs> a completely different direction. <laughs> However, let's say I was going east. I can tell you now for sure I'm going true north, my true north. Oh, I love that. I love that analogy. Yeah. So you have found your calling. So I guess zero degrees, right? That's true north. Let's say I was going at 90 degrees. So now I'm going zero degrees. I got there eventually. Anyway, my story just gets crazier. So nine weeks after my open heart surgery, my mom died. And I'm the only child. And my mom lived on the East Coast. And Fast forward 12 weeks post-open heart surgery, all of a sudden I was packing up her house fresh out of open heart surgery by myself because I just needed to do it alone. I'm a private griever and we have 8 million animals. I said, stay home. I'm going to go deal. And so I packed up her house and I could just sense that there was a much bigger purpose in all of this. She had died of heart failure from alcoholism. And here I had fought to survive. And I just knew I was going to thrive. I just was like, you watch me world. So what if I had open heart surgery? I'm going to just take this world by storm now. That was not helpful. But anyway, I I I respectfully disagree with you, sweetie. I think Mm -hmm. it was helpful. I think you had to 
put yourself in that plane. Otherwise, you would have collapsed in a valley of despair. Probably. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, thankfully, I am a fighter. Unfortunately, I would have two more thoracic surgeries because my body rejected the sternal wires and I had to have them removed. And then, unfortunately, a sternal wire broke off in the sternum during surgery. And so the third surgery was to remove that and to have a titanium plate put in because the upper part of my sternum didn't heal correctly and the Mm -hmm. pain was too much to bear. So I ended up having two more thoracic surgeries. How close in succession were those surgeries? Let's see. So the open heart surgery was in January. Then the sternal wires came out in June, and then the titanium plate was put in and that mist wire taken out in August, all of that year. So my scar was opened up two more times. And it was a really incredible teacher. And for listeners listening, if you want to hear more about that, you can go listen to my story on my podcast. It's an incredible part of the journey that I actually would not take back. I wouldn't take back any of this. So all of that to be said, I've changed a lot. And I always knew I was meant to write books. I wrote a first book in 2021 just to help me process all of this. I have not released it yet. I haven't even sent it to the printer. But then what has come from all of this is a podcast. It came to me intuitively, actually. I am an intuitive It is just part of how I've been knit together, just as much as I have blue eyes and blonde hair. And It came to me one day in a really unique way to start a podcast because I realized as I was going through all of this, how much Facebook helped me. And then I also would look up things on Instagram under hashtags like open heart surgery and congenital heart defect. And I found that the power of story, the willingness of other people to share their stories was what gave me hope and helped me get up out of bed in the morning when I felt like I wasn't going to live another day. And there really isn't another podcast out there like what I'm doing. It's for open heart surgery patients. Mm -hmm. And I'm also highlighting caregivers as well as providers. And I'm finding that people really don't know what it means to not only heal from heart surgery, but how to heal well. They're just not aware. I realized when Aaron, my acupuncturist, had asked me what it meant to heal that I hadn't thought about it at the deepest soul level. And I see open heart surgery as an opportunity that very few people are afforded And I realize people listening to this may want to punch me in the face for saying that, like, how can you think of this as an opportunity that you're afforded? But I really see it that way because the perspective you gain after having your heart literally touched by someone else and you coming out of that, there's reason why there's so many puns from the heart. That's not for the faint of heart or that touched my soul or that tickled my heart well, or pulling at the heartstrings. Right, sure. exactly. Like these mm-hmm. puns exist for a reason and it's rarely gifted to people to actually have their hearts completely literally opened and to then be sewed back together again. It just changes you at the most minute level. And I wanted to be able to provide that hope and that healing to others because staying in victim mindset and staying in fear does nothing for your healing. The goal of the heart chamber is to bring hope, healing, awareness, a different way of thinking about it then maybe you wouldn't hear in your medical provider's office in some random town in Mississippi. I don't know why I'm not choosing Mississippi for any reason. I just pictured a (laughs) state. North Carolina, Texas, Alaska, wherever you are. There truly is healing in stories and knowing that you're not alone. Because I think when you're in the depths of despair and you're wondering if there will be a tomorrow for you, You really want to hear that somebody else was in your shoes at one point and they're doing better now. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just having that one picture of hope can give you that spark that you need to push forward. 
And it sounds like that's what happened for you. So the fact that you want to pay it forward is a huge testament to your character. Thank you. And I've listened to your podcast. You're fun to listen to. You (laughs) do a great job. Tell us a little bit more about your book, and then we'll have you give the URL for your podcast. And friends, I will have that in the show notes. So if you're riding a bike or you're driving your car, you don't have to worry about grabbing a pen. It will be in the description of the show. But first, tell me a little bit more about your book. Thank you. The first book I'm writing will be about the podcast and the wisdom I'm gaining from talking to all these different heart warriors. I'm really excited about the second book because it's got a lot of wisdom in there about living more open-heartedly. And I don't Mm -hmm. want to give away too much yet, but Mm -hmm. it's going to be one of those easy flip through books where you can just get a nugget of wisdom or inspiration and go about your day. And then the third book is actually the really heavy hitting book that I just felt like I couldn't release first. And it's more about my mom dying as I was fighting to live and how I reconcile her really intense death with my intensity of going through open heart surgery and living. And you're going to have to throw COVID in the mix because there's some tension there with the COVID. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think you're brilliant to (laughs) wait until you have all three books done to release them because then you can release them one after another pretty close within a certain time frame and people binge listen to you or binge watch you. I don't know if you're planning on making any of them audio books, but you definitely have the voice that you could (laughs) make an audio book out of them. And I think people would enjoy listening to it, especially anybody who's listened to your podcast. But You have a very compelling story, Boots, and I'm so pleased that you came on the program today to talk about it and to teach me about myocardial bridging and the fact that maybe more people today are being diagnosed with it because there is more wisdom. There is a Facebook group that's willing to share and to probe a little deeper and not take, no, you're fine for an answer. So kudos to you for getting that second opinion and for fighting for your life. I applaud you for that. Thank you. Yes. And my podcast is www.theheartchamberpodcast.com. And you can also listen to it anywhere you get your podcast. Great. Great. I'd also like to invite listeners who would like to share their story. You can leave me a voicemail or get in touch with me on my website. And I'd love to hear from you. That's great. Listen to this, friends, another place where you can have a platform to tell your story. There aren't enough of those. I believe, really, if we had 15 podcasts, if we had 55 podcasts, there still wouldn't be enough because people need to tell their stories. People heal from sharing their stories and people heal from hearing other people's stories. Thank you for giving (laughs) our community another platform where they can share their stories. And especially because Your platform, just like my platform, is a platform of kindness. We share with each other not to be critical, but instead to be supportive. And there's not enough of that in the world, is there, Boots? There isn't, but we are here to spread love and open-heartedness. We are about heart-centered energy awareness. I love Mm -hmm. that. I love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming on the program today, Boots. This has been completely delightful. Thank you so much for having me. Friends, that does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found this program helpful. If you have any questions about the show, please send them to me on the Hug website. That's heartsunitetheglobe.org. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have become inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart community. Heart to Heart with Anna with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard at any time wherever you get your podcasts. A new episode is released every Tuesday from noon Eastern time.